Eric Roop. I'm a, I'm an abdominal radiologist or abdominal imager, and I'm from uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, I think there's some some general misconceptions about a radiologist. So I just want to clear it up off the bat. A radiologist is a doctor. Um, the uh, the people that that acquire the images are technologists. There's a lot of confusion about that. Um, they follow the usual path to to with undergraduate for medical studies and then medical school, and then they do an internship, usually in internal medicine or surgery or or a combination of the two. Uh, they do a four year residency in radiology, and then uh, people that go on to become abdominal imagers have done a one year fellowship. Uh, focusing on abdominal imaging. Obviously, the kidneys are in the abdomen, so you know that's one of the things that they that abdominal radiologists focus on. Um, sometimes they're called body radiologists. That's another word. Uh, they read ultrasounds. Um, they read CTs of the abdomen and pelvis, and a lot of them also will read CT of the chest, including myself. Uh, they read MRI of the abdomen and pelvis. Some abdominal radiologists read PET CT. I read PET CT and enjoy it quite a bit. Um, and some abdominal radiologists perform basic procedures, mostly biopsies and drains. Um, a little bit about myself. I, I am an abdominal radiologist. I'm from the Mid-Atlantic. I'm actually from Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland area. I went to medical school in Washington, D.C. I trained on the West Coast at uh, UC San Diego and UCLA for my residency and fellowship. And I'm now at uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, the number one uh, cancer center in the world. Um, Anyone that can get their care at MD Anderson, I highly recommend it. It's a great place to get care. Uh, that's a picture of my wife and my daughter and my dog. And my wife, uh, my wife is a urologist. Um, she focuses on bladder cancer, but she does quite a bit of kidney cancer as well. So we talk a lot about kidney cancer at home. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about were the are, are the uh, the imaging modalities of kidney cancer. There's there are several. Um, by far, the workhorse and most common. A uh, way to image kidney cancer is CT, uh, computed tomography. Um, it has the highest spatial resolution of all the imaging that I'll, that I'll talk about here. And it, it's definitely the gold standard for imaging the lungs and the chest, looking for metastases there. And um, sort of a toss up whether it's the gold standard for imaging the kidneys. Um, and it's very fast, um, readily available in most places. Um, those, those are sort of the benefits of CT. And I just want to point out there are no cats in a cat scanner in fact the letter a is not really even in there so i'm not sure why some people call it a cat scan but it's it's really a ct scanner or ct scan ct images these are um these two images on the right side of the slider are two um two renal tumors um you can see uh one in the that left hand image is a smaller uh smaller tumor on the right kidney and then in the that right lower image is a small tumor or a much larger tumor in the in the left kidney in radiology the, the images are reversed it's like the patient is laying down in front of you with their feet with their head away from you and their and their feet towards you so the right is on the left and the left is on the right so anyways a little bit about ct <clears throat> so you know the drawbacks of ct it has ionizing radiation which means it can cause some damage to dna um i have some units in there that are that are pretty meaningless to the lay person but chalk it up to say it's about two and a half to seven years of, of background radiation equivalent. Um, we are all getting radiated all the time. Um, uh, your body has mechanisms to deal with this, but obviously getting a CT scan is, is a bit more than your background, what you're getting just living your life. Um, and it requires IV contrast, as we talked about earlier, um, which can be an issue for patients with, uh, with poor kidney function. Um, you can do CT scan of the kidneys without any contrast, but it's really pretty worthless for the most part. Really shouldn't do it for the abdomen and pelvis. Um, if you're looking at the lungs and the chest uh, for metastases, IV contrast is not as important. So you can get away with that without any contrast, but I really wouldn't um, rely on non-contrast imaging of the abdomen and pelvis for, for much in terms of the kidneys. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about uh, MRI. So MRI has a is a um so I should go back up to the CT image. The CT image here you can see it's a it's a it's a donut that you go through and there's an x-ray source and it's spinning around your body and then there's a detector on the other side of the x-ray source and uh, that's how you get the information. Um, it's literally measuring um uh, electron density 
Um, and, uh, and as the x-rays go through you, they get, they got caught up on electrons. And so, you know, it goes quickly through, through fat, it goes slowly through bone. And so that's sort of how it creates the images and soft tissues with in between fat and bone. Um, and that's what the images look like for an MRI. It's much, it's totally different. It's, there's no radiation at all. Um, it relies on a big magnet, um, that's always on a very powerful magnet. You can't have, uh, ferromagnetic things in there. Um, and then there's some additional coils, there's a coil that goes on your body. There's some coils, additional smaller um, gradient coils in the magnet and then a radio frequency transmit coil. I know that's a lot of words, but basically it's measuring the spin of hydrogen ions <clears throat> um, in a gradient and a large magnetic field. Uh, anyways, that's, that's, there's a lot of physics in, in it that I don't want to get into too much today, but uh, it has the highest contrast resolution of the types of imaging that I'll discuss today. And it's the gold standard for most pathology in the abdomen and pelvis. There's, you know, there are some areas where CT outperforms MRI, and there's some areas where MRI outperforms CT. But for the most part, in the abdomen and pelvis, MRI outperforms CT in terms of characterizing things. There's no radiation. There is some energy deposited as heat. If you ever get an MRI, you might feel a little bit warm, and um, it's regulated how much heat they can deposit in your body. But it's really not. There's nothing to worry about there. Um, these are some images, some MRI images, some MR images of renal tumors. You can see the top two images are, this is all the same tumor. I should say the top two images are contrast enhanced T1 weighted fat suppressed images. Basically, you can see at the top of that right kidney, um, there's a tumor. And then the bottom two images are T2 weighted images. And these are kind of the two most important, maybe two of the top three most important pulse sequences that we acquire when we do imaging of the kidneys. And there's a lot of pulse sequences that they do. You'll be in there for a while. MRIs are quite long. Um, anyways, that's that's what it looks like. The, the spatial resolution is a little bit less than CT, but the contrast resolution is much higher. Um, um, so some, some pitfalls of MRI. MRI is really only good for the abdomen and pelvis. It's not very useful for the lungs. Its sensitivity for metastases in the lungs is quite, quite low. Um, the best images require gadolinium based contrast media which is different than the than the iodinated contrast media that they use for CTs um it's it's safer uh gadolinium based contrast media is safer than iodinated contrast media for patients with low kidney function and um actually the the uh the latest contrast agents for MRI are pretty much safe for all patients no matter what your renal function is um, another pitfall of MRI is it's slow. Like I mentioned, it takes a long time and it's not compatible with some implanted medical devices, um, mostly old pacemakers, some neurostimulators, things like that. Um, every device nowadays ha will come with a, with a little, um, uh, FDA clearance, uh, for whether or not it's compatible with MRI and most modern things are, but some older things are not. And, a lot of metal things that might wind up in your body uh, on accident, like old bullets or BBs from a uh, shotgun pellet or things like that are, are often not compatible with MRI. Um, so those are, you know, so one of the limitations of MRI is you might not be able to get it. Uh, next imaging modality I wanted to talk about was uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound doesn't have any radiation. Um, it, uh, just like MRI, it does deposit some energy as heat. You might feel a sense of warmth. It um, Generally, there is no intravenous contrast. It's 99% of the time it's a non-contrast exam. There is an FDA-approved intravenous contrast agent for, uh, for ultrasound. It's called Lumison. Um, I used it a lot in fellowship at UCLA. Um, I haven't really seen it used much otherwise. It's kind of a problem solving agent. It can be really good for patients with low renal function and kidney tumors, but it's not super common. You don't, you just don't see it used very often. Um, and ultrasound is really only good for a couple organs in your body. It's definitely not useful for the lungs or the brain or really anything other than kidneys, liver, gallbladder, and uh, maybe uterus and urinary bladder. Uh, th sorry, this is and this is an image of an ultrasound probe. It it is sending uh, sound waves into your body, and then they reflect off the organs, and then it 
the same probe that's sending the waves measures the, measures the uh, measures the output from your the reflections of the sound wave and and creates an image from that. So this is an example of a renal tumor on uh, on ultrasound. Usually, renal tumors on ultrasound are just an incidental finding. They're not necessarily the ultrasound isn't necessarily ordered to evaluate the renal tumor per se, but you can see it with the ultrasound. Um, it's really not used for kidney cancer except for initial detection, like I mentioned, and hydronephrosis. It's very useful for as a as a focused exam for hydronephrosis, meaning dilation of the renal collecting system, uh, backup of urine in your collecting in the uh, in the kidney. It's good for that. Um, often you'll see it ordered for that. Um, rarely used in kidney cancer patients that can't get MRI and can't get contrast enhanced CT, um, and uh, if you if you can't get an MRI and you can't get a contrast enhanced CT, a contrast enhanced ultrasound is a distant third or fourth option for evaluation of, of a renal tumor. And I've seen that a couple of times and I, I really like it, but it's just not available many places. Um, the next imaging modality that I wanted to talk about was is PET CT or um, positron emission tomography. So PET is used in combination with CT for PET CT. Like I said, they really don't do PET only exams for for cancer. Um, it, it's always almost always PET CT. The most common, by far the most common radioisotope used in PET CT is 18 FDG, uh, which is a sugar molecule bound to a positron emitting radioactive isotope of fluorine. Um, and it's it is a really good way to detect metabolically active tumors. Um, basically tumors that are taking up a lot of sugar meaning they have a lot of metabolic activity will will show up really hot on a pet ct and um this is it's it's like a big ct scanner it has a ct in it it also has stationary pet positron detectors um and um basically you know you get injected with that that fdg that glucose with a with a radio tracer on it the glucose <clears throat> The, the F18 will emit a positron, a positron react with an electron, and there's an annihilation event, and it creates gamma rays, basically. So anywhere that there's a lot of FDG, like in a tumor that's taking up a lot of sugar, um, it'll take up those, those uh, positron-emitting fluorine, and uh, it'll show up as hot on the, uh, on the PET-CT. These are some images. This is an image of a renal tumor on PET-CT. The problem with renal tumors on PET-CT is, is twofold. Uh, most renal tumors are not very metabolically active. They take up very little FDG. And normal kidneys take up a lot of FDG um, because uh, the kidneys are very metabolically active at baseline. Also, FDG is excreted into the urine, so there's a lot of FDG in the renal collecting systems in your urine. And so, um, it's just really not that useful for uh, for detection and characterization of uh, of renal tumors. It if um, if you have metastases, it could be more helpful in that instance. Um, but in the kidneys themselves, it's just not it's not super useful. Um, okay, so one question I was asked to answer was. Um, how can doctors tell a mass is most likely kidney cancer without doing a biopsy? Mm -hmm. So this is a great question. I get this question all the time. Um, so the enhancement characteristics basically will determine the need for biopsy. That's, you know, number one, two, and three is enhancement characteristics, um, which is why it's so important to, to get IV contrast with these, uh, with, with your imaging. Um, there are a couple entities which enhance but are not malignant. Um, most common is angiomyolipomas, which is a benign tumor of the kidney. Uh, they can they usually contain fat, in which case an MRI or a CT can characterize those as well. And we can just write those off into angiomyolipomas. Those generally, unless they're big, they don't get, even need to get followed. They can bleed, but they're benign otherwise. Um, and there are some benign appearing lesions which enhance and do not contain fat. And those are those can be a little tricky, but fortunately, those are relatively rare compared with malignant tumors. And often they're indistinguishable and they wind up coming out anyways. 
if they're large enough, or at least monitored if they're smaller. Um, some examples here include oncocytoma. That's probably the most common enhancing non-malignant renal lesion. Metanephric tumors, hemangiomas. I've seen hemangiomas. They can be really tricky because they enhance a lot. Cystic nephroma, uh, usually more cystic as the name implies. Um, and usually we can characterize those as well. But um, generally, you know, we see a solid enhancing renal mass that doesn't contain fat. And 99% of the time, it's clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Um, and uh, there's really no need to biopsy most of the time. Okay, what types of scan may be done to monitor the effectiveness of kidney cancer treatments? So staging and restaging studies are generally done with CT or MRI. It really depends on who's ordering it and the institution that you're at, what they prefer, if they'd like to get MRIs. Younger patients, especially, I, I, I try to push them to get MRIs because um, radiation is, is uh, more detrimental earlier in life. Later in life, it really doesn't matter as much um because your cells aren't dividing as fast but younger patients really should get monitored with mri of the abdomen or and uh, the pelvis uh, ct always pretty much if you're monitoring for metastases the C use ct um and pet, like i said pet ct and ultrasound really play less of a role uh generally speaking in uh in kidney cancer <laughs> Next question I had was, uh, which reported elements in a kidney report, in a radiology report, are important for the management of kidney cancer? So, um, you know, some, some basic things, the size of the tumor they're gonna wanna monitor, how big it is, and that'll determine, you know, the management as, the, as a primary, you know, pretty much the most important thing is how big it is. Um, and also that'll, you know, how big it is will determine whether you're responding to treatment or not. Um, change in size over time uh invasion of the renal vein is an important thing to to monitor uh that's a poor prognostic factor uh invasion of the renal vein involvement or invasion of any nearby structures particularly the adrenal gland that that um that upstages the tumor extension beyond drotus fascia drotus fascia is a connective tissue sheet that envelops each kidney and each adrenal gland it's another poor prognostic factor if it's if it's extending beyond drotus fascia uh, metastases are something that we're monitoring for. Um, most common sites of metastases are liver, lung, and lymph nodes. I'm, and, you know, rarely can metastasize to other places. Pancreas is one place that uh, renal cell carcinoma can, can go. Um, rarely brain or bone. Uh, but lung, liver, and lymph nodes by far are the most common places for it to go. <clears throat> and uh, the last question um thing i was asked to do was provide a sample report what you know what does a radiology report look like uh for renal you know renal cancer monitoring so this is a report that i did um and uh, you can see this patient has a history of a renal mass um seen on an outside mri os that's what it stands for outside mri uh, they wanted a renal mass protocol ct um renal mass protocol just means it has several phases um, through the abdomen and pelvis. So you can see um, uh, there's the technique listed there. That, so the, I look at the chest. We look for uh, suspicious pulmonary nodules, you know, nodules that were suspicious for metastases. Um, we look for suspicious lymph nodes in the chest. Um, you know, we glance at everything, but really that's what we're looking for. Metastases, the lung and the lymph nodes in the chest. And then um, um, we look at the bones, musculoskeletal findings, and we look for any metastases to the bones. In this case, I didn't see any. And then we look at the abdomen, pelvis, liver. We look for liver metastases. We look at the gallbladder and the spleen and the pancreas. Um, usually I have a little line there that says no pancreatic mass. I suspect that that somehow got uh, omitted from this report. Um, uh, adrenal glands, we look for adrenal metastases, kidneys, and then I described the kidney, heterogeneous arterially hyperenhancing right renal mass extending from the renal sinus. So the renal sinus is the fat in the middle of the kidney through the renal cortex and less than 50% exophytic. Um, the more exophytic the kidney, is, the tumor is, the, the easier it is to cut out. So that's an important thing to mention. A really exophytic tumor would be easy to, to get out. A, a tumor that extends to the renal sinus is harder to cut out um, with a partial nephrectomy. Obviously a, a total nephrectomy, uh, 
you know, it doesn't, these things are less important. Give the measurements um, and then say that there's no tumor in vein. Talk about the lymph nodes again in the abdomen or pelvis. And then, and then I say it's consistent with renal cell carcinoma. Um, and that's pretty much what, uh, what a uh, sample report will look like. Obviously, this patient really only had the primary tumor and nothing else. Um, so, you know, based on how complicated the case is, it can have more or less findings. Mm -hmm.